So it's 1999 and amidst a Y2K panic and a dot-com bubble, whatever that was, and a growing cultural awareness of the internet revolution, The Matrix was released to wide audience and critical acclaim. It's necessary technological advancements in filmmaking, it's overt visual references to anime, and even the mainstreamification of its philosophical themes are now all widely understood, if not lauded. But it's rousing score by Don Davis, while definitely appreciated in film communities and functional within the filmic context, never quite received the same level of acclaim as some of its contemporaries in similarly successful pictures. Davis was notably absent from 2000's Oscar nominations. For at least a decade before and after The Matrix, the majority of the Oscar nominations went to composers working in the predominantly Wagnerian practice of motivic scoring, where a usually melodic idea as a leitmotif becomes emblematic of theme, character, place, setting. But Davis composed predominantly in a 20th century postmodern style, taking particular influence from the minimalist movement. Yes, minimalism. An example of this is his overt references to John Adams' work, Harmony Lair. One of the main tenets of minimalism that Davis used was the idea of cells, where short collection of repeating notes gradually evolve over time. These cells of notes were regarded as having a hypnotic effect early in minimalism's movement. And as Andy Hill explains, the hypnotic effect of minimalist music makes it an especially apt choice for the Matrix, which depicts a world in which human beings have essentially been hypnotized into accepting the counterfeit for the real. The music is the Matrix. And this will prove itself to be true in more ways than one. So by the late 90s, Pop music was still full of electronic music, carrying over from the 1980s, and this had long since started bleeding over into the film music world. And the sci-fi film genre had long since started using electronic or synthesized sounds and musical ideas to denote some kind of technological or artificial theme. So for Davis to use a predominantly symphonic style, with very few minor exceptions, is arguably pretty bold. Late 20th century minimalism isn't necessarily what you'd instinctively think of when you think cyberpunk. It's with Davis's orchestration of these more traditional instruments that he's able to convey the myriad themes from the Matrix, including its advanced computation beyond our comprehension, the duality of our perceived and imperceivable worlds, and in true Hollywood fashion, love. So while the relative absence of melodically motivic content may hinder a score's ability to become iconic in a traditional sense, the practices he uses from minimalism are certainly not without deep dramatic potential. So the intent of a film composer, at least in non-experimental contexts, is not limited to but is likely to include to convey the narrative's themes musically, to ascribe new or enhance existing emotional affect, and more often than not in the symphonic context, to mimic or complement on-screen movement. Now, this can be movement within the frame or of the frame, effectively mirroring or concealing the edit, cutting to different shots within a scene or indeed different locations within a sequence. All of these intentions are apparent in and incredibly important to a film whose narrative is so interlinked with action. Interlinked. Interlinked. So in a way, it was pretty innovative of Davis to look backward for these techniques, to marry them to a picture with these modern themes and on this commercial scale. Despite the obvious importance of action in The Matrix, its hero's journey narrative contains themes of mystery, espionage, and romance, and within each of those a high degree of suspense and or tension. Now, after a hundred years of motion pictures as an art form, its emotion-generating conventions are learned by an audience through osmosis and repetition. As an example, in this excerpt from Through the Surveillance Monitor, long high notes on violins can be heard playing a semitone apart, and this would, for most if not all, evoke suspense through its dissonance. Now, listeners without a musical background may not understand the notes' relation to one another, but whether through this device's associations with past on-screen tension or something more innate in the metaphysical properties of the notes' interplay, the audience's agreed understanding of it allows a composer to encode the score with meaning and for the audience to decode it accurately. However, by taking these two same notes, a semitone apart, we can reharmonize them, effectively shifting the perception of key center. So rather than treating them as a root note and minor second, a composer can 
decontextualized dissonance as perhaps a major third and fourth suspension or a major seven and root note octave for something that is more diatonic and more subjectively harmonious. Again, the typical moviegoer isn't aware of these psychoacoustic considerations, but the emotional reception is suitably altered nonetheless. So, while Davis didn't use leitmotif in the overt Wagnerian sense, the film is certainly not without its identifiable themes, and in the spirit of minimalism, these tend to gravitate around the textural rather than the melodic. Perhaps the most recognisable of this is the polytonality he uses in the main brass swells that we hear at the beginning and throughout the rest of the film. These brass swells alternate between an E minor and a C major triad, at least in its first iteration. While all notes within both are common tones within E minor, the dissonance between the B and the C as the fifth degree of the E minor scale and the first degree of the C major scale respectively signifies a kind of duality, effectively describing the overlapping nature of the matrix's simultaneous realities. However aptly subconscious that association is, the very fundamental level we're aware of two distinct somethings overlapping one another. A key aspect of Davis's writing is a propulsive sense of forward momentum. This lays the foundation for the fast-paced and, at that point in time, unprecedented action in the film. Whoa. But this sense of rhythmic momentum permeates even the quietest, most stationary scenes with a degree of complexity, and portrays through that dichotomy intrigue. It would be easy to assume that these very 20th century devices like polytonality, dissonance, that level of rhythmic complexity are all aleatoric in nature, where randomness, chance, or even player improvisation amounts to a uniquely disorganized chaos. But this sense of complexity is very much prescribed by Davis and is achieved through multiple parts playing identical note cells slightly out of sync with one another. The number of grouped ascending semiquavers correspond to a numerical value between two and seven, where then a randomized sequence of numbers produces a randomized sequence of ascending semiquaver runs. This is definitively explored and catalogued in Christopher James Heckman's excellent thesis from 2018 and even further extrapolated in the amazing Sideways video essay. So without borrowing too heavily from their work we can focus more on the perceived intent. This planned randomness projects a kind of hyper granularity which perfectly describes the mathematical intricacies of the matrix and its computer code that both we and the character see on our respective screens. Sorry. Okay. In quite a direct way, this becomes a descriptor of on-screen movement, as well as narrative forward propulsion. This is known as a perpetuum mobile, and the wind players responsible for playing these passages ironically would likely need machine-like stamina to get through them, and saved only by their pianissimo performance marking, they are providing us with a constant sense of forward momentum bubbling under the surface. Now the most obvious proponent of orchestral rhythm is the percussion section, and while struck transient percussion is certainly featured heavily in the Matrix, most notably the anvil. Another untuned modern percussion instrument has a unique place in the tapestry of the Matrix's textural motifs. The waterphone is a metallic instrument with an icy sonority. It's made from many metal rods which are welded to a base containing water. This allows a percussionist to strike or bow the rods on a tangent, moving the water around in the base to pitch shift or mute the notes. In the Matrix, Davis employs this as another evocation of intrigue which is likely only possible by an audience's relative unfamiliarity with the texture, even though its use in film does date back to 1979's Star Trek The Motion Picture, but its relatively infrequent use allows it to function. As well as the main polychord brass motif, there are other shorter predominantly brass swells peppered throughout the picture. These abruptly terminating swells have a kind of reverse-like effect and almost audibly trace a movement, almost like a data transfer, with the abrupt stop denoting its completion, much like the agents as they transfer themselves into a new body. All of these short audio stings prove how non-melodic music, or indeed non-musical audio, can take on their own motivic properties in the context of film, where coupled with the visual, a multi-sensory connection is forged and importantly remembered. 
Action cues are generally fast paced and frantic and Davis is masterful in portraying the kinetic progressive chaos of the Matrix's action scenes. He does this through shifting harmony and polyrhythmic writing across all families of the orchestra. Whereas iconic action scenes from the Spielberg Williams school of film take place over multiple disparate locations within the same action sequence, many of the Matrix's action sequences, while of course progressive, are single location. The multiple different locations within a scene allows the composer to keep things really fresh with harmonic modulations. But as Andy Hill observes, Davis uses John Adams' technique of harmonic gating and rhythmic dissonance to gradually morph both the key center and perceived tempo of the piece. Avoiding harmonic fatigue over extended action sequences is a primary concern of a composer and their ability to satisfyingly evoke an ever unfolding situation. The extended nature of the harmonic gating technique, where newly introduced repeated dissonant notes gradually displace the original, in Adams' words, brings in a new key area almost on the sly, stretching the ambiguity out over such a length of time that the listener would hardly know a change has taken place. He does this in combination with its rhythmic equivalent, using overlaid polyrhythms to do much the same to the audience's perception of tempo, where syncopated accents and tuplets disorient the listener from the whereabouts of a clear pulse. Through these devices, Davis is able to do far more than keep things fresh. He's able to maintain that sense of hypergranularity from the quieter moments into the extended action cues. Wonderfully portraying a sense of constant moving parts, different character motivations, and again, importantly, on-screen motion. Davis agreed with the Wachowskis around the suitability of a choir featuring in The Matrix. He states, From my standpoint, I could see the choir as representing the humanity that was overcome by the machines. The directness of sound originating from the body that the human voice generates is visceral and universal. Davis employed a solo female voice for the scene where he is being nursed back to health after awakening from The Matrix for the first time. The line oscillates between two notes a tone apart, an F and G. In some ways this can be seen as mimicking the dual nature of the main brass swells, or even the first two notes of the main motivic cell that Davis uses for intrigue and momentum. Also, the matriarchal connotations of the solo female voice, while a gendered trope of traditional film scoring, still holds a semiotic usefulness due to the learned past associations through previous film experiences as we discussed earlier. So because of that, the caregiving is present in the scene, but due to the solo nature of the voice, so is Neo's isolation and kind of uncertainty around his current circumstances. The solo voice is accompanied by mainly the string choir, oscillating between an F minor and a D minor chord. Now, these aren't diatonic, but this is a common use of chromatic medians in film music, where third and sixth chords have their tonalities altered slightly for interesting harmonic shifts. opening up voice leading for harmonic modulations. Its analog in rock and pop music is planing, where a chord shape is moved up and down, regardless of the overall tonality. For example, many songs with a tonal center of E minor pentatonic will use a first chord of E major, creating a tension and release between the implied G sharp and C sharp in the scale of E major, but actually playing chords G and C. The attitude this can add to popular music is used frequently in film, but minor chord planing is far less frequent in popular music. David Bennett explores this really well in a video I'll link in the description. Now, the main example of the human voice in The Matrix is the full choir. Reserved for moments of true awe and horror, the biblical aural spectacle of the choir is used empathetically to describe the hellish. The grandiosity of the choir seems to be universal, and it's, forgive me, epic connotations and godly evocations kind of denote unending universal proportions. The choir in near isolation can be heard in the scene where Neo awakens from the pod for the first time. and he tries to contemplate the magnitude of the horror of what the human race has become. The choir here literally laments the fate of mankind and the dynamics of its sound, whether through the amplification of its recording or the sheer number of assembled singers is just so effective in describing scale. In 
this instance, that scale or magnitude describes billions of people, unconscious, deceived, confined to pods in towers so tall that their bases and peaks are unseeable. The choir sings in dissonant clusters, and in the filmic context at least, it's very evocative of Kubrick's use of Ligeti's choral clusters from Kyrie in 2001, A Space Odyssey. There, the choir's human voice ironically represented the monolith's very non-human technology, sitting somewhere beyond our comprehension, and not unlike the incomprehensibility of the choir's description of heavenly beauty in its more original churchly context. Here though, Davis's intent is to utilise the human voice for that sense of scale, but also to lament the human loss. Neo and Trinity's love theme is the closest Davis gets to leitmotif. Though its expression doesn't fully occur until the end of the second Matrix sequel, the theme in the first movie is more a collection of notes whose interval is alluded to and augmented throughout the rest of the trilogy. In the Matrix, it's a short gesture as Neo saves Trinity from the helicopter. Here, it's a moment of triumph played mainly on strings with a brass pedal note accompaniment to maintain a sense of urgency for us to continue on to the main third act action set piece. Its second play occurs as Trinity in turn saves Neo. Now, since they last saw each other, they had entered the Matrix, freed Morpheus, Trinity was saved from death and escaped, Neo defeated Smith at much physical cost only for Smith to regenerate, Neo is chased and killed by Smith, then revived by Trinity, then kills Smith again with some finality, and then finally escapes to the world in time to avoid certain death at the hands or tentacles of sentinels. Such dramatic peaks could only be followed by a quiet sense of catharsis. as they return to each other. The return of the theme this time plays piano, an octave lower, this time for viola. It is iterated upon in later films where it gravitates more around Trinity and her death with again gendered tropes with woodwinds equating to the feminine archetype. But importantly, the expressive potential of woodwinds and strings there can't be undervalued. So arguably the winds are scoring the delicateness and the melancholy of the situation as opposed to Trinity's femininity. Overall, the music of The Matrix is perhaps the 20th century's last great original score. The film is a true action sci-fi landmark in Hollywood cinema, but its score is every bit as successful in its own right. The music's influence on subsequent film scores outside of the realm of direct pastiche is subtle if at all evident, and along with its contributions to this film's unique visionary story, it's able to maintain its unique place in film history. Now, to better understand some of these devices discussed, I'm going to be recreating the cue ontological shock from the end of act two. The music touches upon the majority of the devices and the themes that we've discussed. Given the complexity of the composition and my relatively untrained ear, I've programmed the brass section from a score that I found online, but only the brass because truthfully that was all that was available for free. The remaining orchestration is my ear's closest approximation. So I'd love for you to stick around and have a listen to part two. Cool. So this is my session. This is Ontological Shock by Don Davis. Um, I chose this cue um, partially because I could find the brass sheet music online on a YouTube video. Uh, so credit to that person. I can't remember who they are, but I'll, I'll link them in the description. And also because it is a real amalgamation. It's the end of the second act. And in terms of the bullet time stuff, in terms of uh, the narrative action, it's really in the thick of it here. So it combines all of those different techniques that we've been talking about. And it has a little bit of that love theme at the end as well, which is just really beautiful and lyrical, even though it's very, very short. So I figured I'd just give it a full playthrough and then we'll go through a couple of bits and bobs. So yeah, here is my recreation of ontological shock.
So it's a pretty amazing cue. Uh, it's full of different ingredients and techniques, and it's describing very high stakes in in its in its scene within the film. So yeah, let's let's kind of unpack some of this brass because I think that's the most accurate part. Um, in particular, this center section here in the helicopter. So as we were discussing earlier, there's this kind of need to keep things fresh. There's this kind of uh, need to harmonically shift so that the listener doesn't fatigue, even though the actual stuff that's happening on the helicopter is insane. And, you know, there's two people hanging off the bottom of it. It's still like a singular setting. So you need to rise and, and augment the stakes going through. So if we listen to the horns, these have this kind of um, interchange between straight notes and tuplets. completely two different keys and it's almost like the horns are the more steadfast trinity trying to find a landing pad and then the trumpets are describing the frantic kind of panic of I'm sure Morpheus and Neo are experiencing as well on kind of irregular time um these time signature changes which i got from the score even though that's kind of a function of the spotting process where you kind of change the time signature to hit your marks within the visual sequence it kind of adds a sense of disorientation to the matrix in particular who is already kind of playing with these time change ideas so it's kind of a nice byproduct of that. Less accurately though is probably some of the string runs. Some are better than others, but I was kind of guessing the notes because they're also so low in the mix as well. Um, I was kind of hearing the accented highest note of each of the uh, kind of ascending runs of these cells and then just kind of reverse engineering from there kind of leading into those definite kind of highest notes of each of those little runs. Um, so see if I can find a good example of that. Ah, this is a console Dino line. This is one of the simpler ones. I think it's just four notes. I mean, the samples can sound quite artificial, but in the mix, it kind of really sits nicely. Oh, that was one, maybe. Yeah, I think that was one of the more accurate runs, just picking out the highest note of each of those little ascending pieces and working backwards from there. And that one sounds really naff, but it's actually doubled from the trumpets, um, which is kind of accurate. And then this one, I think I got pretty close, particularly in context. And then those long tremolos are always the easiest to pick out, which is nice. So I remembered that a couple of years ago, I randomly picked up a waterphone library from Spitfire Audio. I think it was on sale at the time. And these are really authentic sounding. It's really cool, really cool texture. Chuck that in the mix and we'll see how it sounds. just adds that touch on top it just makes it really authentically matrix sounding there's just something intangible about it because of those associations just a little bit on the love theme at the end then just because i mean it's super short but it's really lovely and lyrical and these samples really help it sing harp comes in typical of romance Super high, soaring right up there. Really beautiful. Just this ambient kind of pad. It's completely filling the scene with that bullet time feeling from those overlapping brass, but they're much lower down in horns. And even though it's incidental, it's, it's underscore for a conversation. 
it just allows us to keep feeling the fact that the scene is filled with that bullet timiness that he's really embodying his new abilities the whole time even while it's under just a conversation. So the last little bit I wanted to mention around the actual interplay between diegetic sound, sound effects, in-world sound, and the music. If we have a look at the waveform here of the original, it's around the time where the helicopter's going down, and you can actually see on the waveform the individual whoop, 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 of the helicopter blades. Turn this up. And after this, when the helicopter crashes, there's this cacophony of sound effects happening. And I didn't really appreciate just how much the music would pull away. Your instinct as a composer is to describe the grandiosity, but sometimes silence says more, I guess. And we really come all the way out of it. And we just have this contrabass drone making way for all of those sound effects and just the sheer scale to sink in. And then we come back in into the love theme. It's really beautifully spotted. It's completely operatic in scale. And yeah, it just makes me appreciate Don Davis so much more. I already knew he was a genius, but just honestly, this is a really once in a lifetime score. And yeah, I guess I can't wait to try and fit some of these particularly rhythmic and harmonic techniques into some of my own writing. So it's really exciting. So that was episode one of this little series. I'm hoping to do maybe five or six more episodes. I have a couple of scores in mind. So if you've liked the essay and discussion around some of these devices, then please pop back for those subsequent episodes. And you can hear a lot more about some of my other favorite film scores, like comment, subscribe, obviously, and hit the bell to be notified. So you will see as soon as I post those new videos, really looking forward to getting those out the door. Thank you if you've made it this far and yeah, hope to see you in the next one.